the decline of the American family is hurting the soul of America. And we've got to change that. Just a little... Do you want four more years of government for the privileged few? I can't afford to be preoccupied by that sort of nickel and dime stuff. If you're feeling inundated by politics, don't worry. Our next piece is not about elections, but it does carry an important message about something that sure is related, leadership. Please watch closely. I think you'll find this a profound story. In any group, some children have more influence than others. They get what they want more often. They are the leaders. Colgate University student Lily Cabazon is trying to figure out who the leaders are in this group of five-year-olds. We're trying to get an objective view and a measurement of which children are dominant and which children are submissive. And it was done through observation while the children are free at free play. Oh, yeah, right. Lily doesn't just watch and decide who seems dominant and who seems submissive. She has a much more precise method. What she does is count. She keeps track of a range of behaviors that indicate dominance. Some are obvious, like telling someone what to do. And, uh, Caitlin, you go, but I have a next door neighbor that does. But I have a next door neighbor that does. Jessica on the left commands, and Caitlin obeys. Here's Sean on the right, tells his friend what to do. You pick the one. Quiet. Lily also counts physical dominance. Who initiates it? Who is the target? Here, Caitlin is on the receiving end of a bite. Gestures are also important, like hands on hips and chin thrusts. Both mean dominance. Facial expressions count too, like this submissive smile. When it's all tallied, the results are clear. Sean has an extremely high dominant score. He is a leader in the group. So is Jessica. Caitlin has one of the lowest dominant scores. What makes certain kids dominant? What's their secret? Psychologist Kerry Keating believes it's gestures and expressions that matter most. What we say is less important than how we say it. To test this, Carrie has designed a fascinating experiment. In real world dominance situations, in, in real world leadership situations, it's frequently not the words that people say that distinguish them as leaders. They don't often have the best words and they don't often have the best ideas necessarily. But what they have is a way to move us. What we're really studying here is a little chunk of what you might consider that charisma that defines leaders. What we're going to do is I'm first going to tell you a secret, okay? All right, so we're going to ask Carrie to leave. Oh, okay. We're going to tell secrets that I don't get to hear. No. I'll be back later. Okay. As a test of charisma, the children will be put in a psychological hothouse. They'll be asked to lie a real tiny sip. This juice has been heavily laced with salt and baking soda. Do you like it? You don't like it. Does it taste yicky? Okay, it tastes yucky. So when Carrie comes back, okay, you're gonna tell her, we're gonna pretend that we like it, okay? Ooh, I heard a knock. Look at all that nice juice over there. Did you have a drink? Was it a good drink? Yep. Yep. Why? What did you like about it? Mm. How did it taste? Good. Good. Yeah. Caitlin's nonverbal persuasion good. skills are not proving to be very persuasive. Could it taste good? It tastes good. Yeah. What makes a bad liar is that they leak. They leak non-verbally with gestures and facial expressions very subtle body movements scratching themselves and picking at their clothing those kinds of 
activities, which are basically nervous activities, tend to leak out when people are deceptive. Here's an instant replay. Watch for the lip licking, the nervous smile, the downward glance. How did the market do? It tastes good? Huh? Yeah. What did it taste like? Sean's deception, on the other hand, barely leaks out at all. It's hard to spot any of those nonverbal giveaways. Uh, yeah, what would they like about it? The taste. They like the taste? What did you like about it? Because it tastes more sweet. Now you decide. Would these children fool you? Yeah, what would they like about it? Because it tastes a little Here's the sweet. best way to judge nonverbal behavior. Get rid of the distracting words. Just focus on the faces. This is exactly what this panel of judges does as the final step of the experiment. They decide who is telling the truth and who is being deceptive. And here are the results. Sean was the best at fooling the judges. Jessica was a close second. And Caitlin was the worst. And look at how that compares to the leadership ratings from the classroom. Remember, Sean was the most dominant child. You, 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 you. Followed closely by Jessica. This is funny. <laughs> and the least dominant, Caitlin. Carrie finds this connection again and again. The girls and boys best at the deception task are the most dominant in their social group. Their nonverbal behavior is the most persuasive even when they're not telling the truth. What happens when kids grow up? Does the essential connection between nonverbal persuasion and leadership remain? If it does, then we should be able to predict which of these adults will be dominant simply by watching them lie. This tastes really good. Do you think young children would like that? Oh, sure. Chris is probably not going to be dominant. He's a terrible liar. Ty's not very convincing either. Michael's pretty good. Not too much in his expression. Jeff is a real poker face. It's impossible to tell whether he's lying or telling the truth. So he should be the dominant type. You have just crash landed in the woods of northern Minnesota and southern Manitoba. The last weather report indicated that the temperature would be minus 25 degrees in the daytime and minus 40 at night. While escaping from the plane, your group salvaged the In this next items. part of Kerry's experiment, we'll be able to see if the prediction is correct. This group has to work together to figure out how to survive a plane crash. But it's not the group's ideas that matter to Kerry. It's who emerges as a leader. Okay, you can begin. All right, okay. Um, I don't think we really need this cigarette lighter. It has no fluid. It will serve absolutely no purpose, so therefore it should go relatively well, light. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Spark, yeah, yeah, you can use a spark. Spark. Yeah. Knife, I think, is absolutely essential. That probably number one. The discussion meanders for a while, and then Jeff takes control. Okay, guys, what I think we need to do first is to decide. I mean, I know, like in a wilderness uh, type survival situation, you have priorities and that you should assess your priorities first and then rank your materials to kind of correspond with your priorities? Well, what than... about um, food? I mean, if you can't necessarily assume that you're going to be wrecked, you, I mean, you can provide yourself shelter, but you have to come up with possibly some substance. Right. Possibly get... get Chris, who, remember, was a terrible liar, has some good ideas. But according to Kerry, that's not what it takes to be a group leader. We'll, we'll say prepare for a long stay. Last. Okay. That person may not be the person with the most information or the best ideas, but that's the person who is best at maneuvering and manipulating uh, the group members, uh, helping them along with their ideas, 
and uh, making members feel that they have moved towards some consensus. Okay, does everybody agree with that? Yes. Jeff, who is proving to be an expert at consensus building, is also a student leader on campus. The next thing you want to do is be rescued, okay? It was uh, cold and refreshing, and it... What about adult women? Want to have more of it. It was very... Would you predict that Paula would be a leader? How about Kathy? Maria? Whatever you guessed, you're probably wrong. Remarkably, for women, Carrie has found no relationship between deception and leadership. A leader will still emerge from this group, but Carrie does not yet know how to predict who that leader will be. You can just kind of break. Well, I guess if you need to yeah, big. big All she can say is that women who are good at deception are not necessarily good at leading their peers. Food is your last priority, like actual food. I've, I've heard because that you can, you I can, mean, you can, things. and you can survive for up to six weeks without food. This is but with adult right. males, as with children, Carrie has found an unmistakable connection. Our laboratory research has shown that males who are best at a deception task and emerge as leaders among their peers. It's not necessarily the case, though, that leaders disguise the truth any more than the rest of us do. But the implications of our research are that if they chose to do so, they would be very, very good at it. The past 20 years of American politics haven't left us very enthusiastic about the idea of leadership. But Carrie Keating's research is not just another knock on politicians. What she's telling us is something more troubling. The skill that makes people persuasive can also make us trust them, even when they're lying. That's why elections are hard work for us voters, as well as for the candidates. We have to check things out for ourselves and make choices based on facts, not on images. Mm -hmm.